This is Distant Replay, the podcast that goes back in time to relive all the greatest events that we witnessed in sports. From upsets, to championships, to cultural moments, we discuss it all. Coming up on today's episode. Please forgive me, but sometimes I get very emotional when I talk about my son. transcend this game and bring to the world a humanitarianism which has never been known before. It's time now to go back to a documentary. We're talking Tiger, the HBO documentary that released its first episode this past week, we're recapping it as part of our Distant Replay podcast. Welcome in. I'm Ben George. He is Mike Noto. And Mike, just first off, my voice might not be perfect. Return from the national championship game. So I'm still in recovery mode. So just kind of bear with me today. Hey, look, you got to enjoy one of your teams winning a national championship. So congratulations <laughs> to the Crimson Tide once again. Um, it seems like it's a, an annual occurrence. Feels great. Feels great. But we're going to we're gonna have some fun today um, going through this Tiger doc. This is, if you haven't heard about it yet, it just released on HBO. This is kind of a, a look at like his early life, his rise to stardom, his his time and power as a PGA superstar, then kind of the fall, the you know everything that happened with his wife, and then the scandals that followed, and then his rise back to coming back to the Masters uh, and winning that in 2019. So First part today, we'll get into a reminder. Again, you can find everything online. DistantReplayPodcast.com is the website, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube as well. Thanks to everyone on YouTube that has been subscribing at a rapid pace right now, which has been awesome to see. So we appreciate that. So let's jump into this, Mike Tiger. Part one, I think this one is pretty clear that it's kind of setting the stage, right? You got the early life. You got some of his younger teenage life. It's an amateur playing golf. And then the very first part of his professional career where he really kind of explodes onto the scene it's kind of all setting the stage for what's to come yep so a lot a lot of background information in this in this episode if you're not aware of tiger woods's background so i know i was aware of a lot of the stuff in this episode but i also learned a lot and as we've gone through with these documentaries that's what i want from a documentary right i want to sit down and even if it's a topic i'm familiar with like a tiger woods it's always good when you get these little tidbits that maybe you didn't know before and i thought that this episode uh, delivered those and let's be clear. I mean, like the Jordan documentary, we went back through episode by episode, The Last Dance. That was a Jordan approved documentary. He had his hands all in that documentary. It was great. It was great, but it was very pro Michael Jordan. This documentary is not going to be the same thing. It's not. And I thought the key thing is, though, you could tell from the first scene, it's not going to be a Tiger Woods approved documentary. But I thought the good balance they have is they have people in the documentary that are in the know that were very close to Tiger Woods. So you're getting an authentic story about how his life really was. So I thought there was a, I think there's a great balance in that respect. And the first scene with his father at a press conference, uh, the first scene of the documentary really sets the tone for this episode. It's basically his father. At this point, this press conference is pretty popular. And he's basically saying, you know, I brought Tiger along. He's my gift to the world and he's going to change the world. We go from that speech right to a picture of him in his mugshot, the famous one where he looks a little glazed over <laughs> with the white Nike shirt on. Yeah, We go from that speech to that mugshot right into the documentary. And at that point, like you said, Ben, I, I, I thought, hey, look, we're going to get a really good look into, into Tiger Woods. This is not going to be, um, like you said, the Jordan one was great, but this is going to be a more raw account of his life. Yeah, that, I thought that was a, a very powerful first scene to kind of like, okay, you're showing this look inside jail as he's walking to get his mugshot taken. And it's, and it's uh, you know what's going to come. It's not going to be something that we're, we're all pro-Tiger. I just hope that as we move along, things are pretty fair and it's not just a heavy, like, here's all the things Tiger's done wrong over the course of his life. Uh, because I think when we step back from it, eventually – it's going to be a very small section of his life, I think, um, you know, from the beginning to and then the aftermath where now we see him with his, his son and, and, and become, being a good father and whatnot. I just hope that this isn't going to be the the overpowering aspect of this documentary, but, but it might be because that's what people want to see. Right. When they when they turn on a Tiger Woods documentary, you know, I think they're going into it 
saying, okay, I want to see what the scandal was all about. Yeah, I, th I think the scandal will be probably the more sought after part of this documentary. I think there are a lot of people though that might, I think Tiger Woods appeals to a golf fan. The, the, he attracts to the, he's unique. He attracts to the hardcore golf fan and he attracts to the casual golf fan like me. Right. So for me, some of these stories, even in this episode were very interesting. And I think the next episode will only be more interesting as we kind of peel back the onion on that. But I thought his father's press conference, getting back to that for a second, Ben, I don't know what your thoughts were on that, but it was basically Earl Wood saying, here's my gift to the world. I brought him to this point. Here he is world. Don't screw him up. Now, I have a little different perspective than you just because I've, I've read a couple of Tiger books, followed, you know, followed his career pretty closely. I'm pretty familiar with many of the background because I think that's where a lot of people aren't too clear on, right? And we get a lot of that within this episode is who is Earl Woods and who is his wife or who is yeah, Earl Woods' wife, Tiger's mother, uh, Tita, right? That, that's who we get to kind of learn about. And with, with Earl, I don't know. I mean, I think like anybody, there's multiple layers to a person, right? I mean – we're in an age now, Mike, where everything's got to be black and white, but there's there's a lot more to people um, day to day. And that's who Earl, that's that's just like Earl, right? I mean, a very good father, right? Spent hours and hours and hours with his son, trying to teach him the game, help bring him along, do everything he can to pre prepare him for this career, right? He did everything he could do to get him ready to, to be a star on the PGA Tour and make a lot of money and provide for himself. But on the other side of that, that coin is a guy that was very – tough right he had this army background a green beret this military background he instilled in tiger and we've seen that over his lifetime um, but also along with that he was he was a womanizer and you know one of the, the things that i was never aware of that I, I learned in this episode is that he had a winnebago that he would drive to the course he would spend all day you know with tiger practicing playing he'd also bring out a woman a lot of times different women and kind of teach them the game i guess as a way to to get him out to the course, but he would also spend some time in cocktail hour in the Winnebago, which is crazy to me. It's crazy to me that Tiger was at the course when this was going on. Yeah. One. Crazy that Earl did not try to hide it from all accounts. And he primarily does this through a gentleman named Joe Groman. So this is a, this is taking place at the Navy, the Navy golf course, right? right? Is that the best way to put it? Yep. And it's out in the open. He's doing it with a guy named Joe Groman, who is the, you know, uh, the club pro, if you will. Yep. And this guy, they were getting these stories from this guy, Groman. And it's very interesting to hear his perspective because um, I don't think he has any reason to lie. You know what I mean? He's very emotional when he's telling, when he's telling the story about, you know, what used to go on at these courses that Ben just described. And you go from learning how this guy is a great teacher to his son to the tours in Vietnam and the things he did in Vietnam, which were very heroic, and then to the womanizing part. Like you get all these different layers of Earl Woods that I was all aware of them, like in, in the most basic form, but the details of how they played out and the impact they had on Tiger were really eye-opening. They are eye-opening, and if you if you haven't heard these stories or seen these, I mean, I, you know, you will get a good a good look at that. And there are some good home videos. Like I think that was another good thing about this documentary so far is that they do provide some new video that you haven't seen before, which always astounds me to see like what was taken. Like they actually had a shot of the Winnebago, which, which still blows my mind that there's video of this Winnebago. Of, you of know. Tiger playing, Tiger playing <laughs> golf with the Winnebago in the background. It's, it's like so, I don't know if foreshadowing is the right word, but it's so like perfect because you picture Tiger Woods practicing golf and his dad in the Winnebago having cocktail hour. And listen, it's not like today where everything is, is captured on video, like every single moment of your life, mundane or extraordinary. We're talking about a time when like video, you know, if you did have a video recorder, you could maybe record an hour of tape and you know, then you got to sort it out and organize it. You know, it, and you got to find that tape later on. Like, I don't know how in a lot of these documentaries, they have these pieces of tape stored somewhere that, that are perfect for this, but HBO does dig out some of them. What do you make of, of, of Earl uh, Woods in, in the fact that, uh, you know, he, you know, you're talking about that speech, but, you know, throughout his life, I mean, from the very beginning when Tiger was very young, he's been saying this the whole time that Tiger's going to change the sport as we know it. From the time he was, you know, a couple of years old, I mean, you know, as a father, you know, you, you like to think those things and you hope those things and you, you try to push maybe your child towards those things. But do you think he actually truly believed that Tiger – was going to be this special or was this him just kind of selling it kind of like a, I think of like the the ball family, right? Like 
You really That's sell, 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 mind. right? And then, you know, you hope it all comes to fruition. It's a big marketing plan that hopefully it comes together. But it seemed to me like Earl really, truly felt this from the very beginning. Yeah, I do not get LeVar Ball vibes from Earl Woods. Look, Earl Woods had a lot of, uh, you know, had some good good things about him, bad things about him as we get. But I do not think he was a kind of like snake oil salesman type like a LeVar Ball. And well, I think he really believed look, he, look, he made no bones about it. He said Tiger Woods was not only going to change golf, but he was going to change the world through golf. Right. And back then to hear that, I was like, what golf? Like, you know, how, how could anyone change the world through golf? If an athlete's going to change things, you know, maybe it's through basketball, baseball, or one of the mainstream sports. But I thought that, you know, some of the interesting stories they told about his development, about Tiger's development, about mm-hmm. how Earl taught him the game from the green back because he was so small. Right. You know, m- most of us, when we start to play golf and get a club in our hands, we just want to see how h- far we can hit it. You know, yep. He learned the game the other way. We get a lot of these stories from Pete McDaniel, who's a family friend of the Woodses, and gives a unique perspective. I thought that was really good. And the story about the water, I thought was very interesting. Do you remember that one, Ben? Go, yeah, go ahead and tell that story. All right, so the Pete McDaniel tells the story that when Tiger was very little, when they, when they came to like a water hazard on the course... Tiger used to say, Daddy, wah, 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 which if you have kids or been around kids, that's how most kids say water. And then Earl would say, yes, son, wah, wah, son. And then he would pause and say, wah, wah, bad. <laughs> and it's just interesting because, you know, it's, it's teaching them golf at the same time, interacting with your son and getting down to their level, which it seemed like Earl was very good at, that even at a young age, he could put things to Tiger in a way to teach him the game, even though, as you know, if you've dealt with younger kids, it's impossible to teach them anything at a certain age. But he was able to 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 get his message across to Tiger and start developing him very early. Yeah, he, he that, that that was uh that was a good story, and it was pretty cool to see some of that training early on because that that was he did spend a lot of time with him. I mean, even to the point where you know I, I don't think I've ever heard the story about Tiger actually sitting in the high chair, you know, when he was one year old or not maybe not even one and just watching his dad hit golf balls which is crazy to me that any kind of kid would focus on something like that and be that locked into something without wanting to to you know 30 seconds later look for something else to do so you i guess from that respect i can kind of see how his dad knew that this is his passion right like his he, there's a special bond between golf and tiger but the thing that he's going to change the world is uh is pretty remarkable but you see some of these things you know you know the story i thought was really cool is the pro the, the, the golf course as you mentioned yeah out playing with with earl for the first time and or early on when he did you know was at the course i think he came over to the navy golf course in san diego you know at some point and met earl early on but you know he just thought of tigers is earl's son that's it and they were on the course and you know he's talking he's making noise every time tiger hits he's, he's making noise talking you know speaking loudly eventually this guy says earl what are you doing you be quiet while your son hits a golf ball and Earl, of course, gets pissed because he's, as like anything, he's got a plan for what he's doing. And he says, look, I'm preparing him for the, the PGA Tour. And, the, and Tiger's like five or six this time. And he's like, I'm, I'm preparing him for the tour and the distractions, people moving, jingling keys in their pocket, like all the stuff you're going to hear and see while you're trying to focus on making a putt or hitting a shot. I thought that was remarkable. Like those kind of things, the, the detail. When you look back at a, at a, at a superstar's like life, like it's these little details that you know people don't see along the way. They just think he kind of you know kind of happens, but it's just day in day out of doing these things to get somebody to that point. Yeah, look, Tiger as a golfer, right? So I don't know much about the technical aspects of golf, right? But what I do know is certain traits of an athlete that make them special, and this is the beginning of Earl Woods cultivating Tiger on what would become Tiger's best trait in my mind, which is his laser focus. That's, Mm -hmm. to me, when I think of Tiger Woods, that's what I think of. Nothing on the golf course, you know, gets in this guy's head. And it started with stories like this, like you just outlined. So as we go from there, like it kind of transitions into his uh, young adulthood, high school, um, early college. But really, from going from spending all this time with his dad, right, best friends, they both say best friends, they spend all these hours together, really enjoy spending the time together. Both of them do. And he goes from that to kind of, you know, into high school where he's meeting new people. He's getting out a little bit more, not a lot, but he's in class. Like he's actually interacting with people. And this is a guy that's really been laser focused from an early age to play golf. That's it. So now he kind of meets his first girlfriend. And I think this is maybe where a lot of people might 
kind of find interesting in this documentary. It was written, it was really good in this the latest book about Tiger that's out that I think by Jeff Benedict that kind of tells a lot of the story. I think I would recommend you you reading that as well if you really want to get in this. But you kind of learn about these relationships that Tiger had. But you know his first girlfriend is an interesting one because. You know, she was someone that you know, d- didn't, I mean, obviously I had no idea who Tiger is or who, what Tiger would become, right? She kind of got a, saw a little bit of that early on with some of the interactions on the golf course with people. But you kind of see him opening up a little bit and becoming an actual, I would not say a person, but not that machine that we're used to seeing, like dancing at parties, having a good time, kind of finding himself, you know? Yeah, so the, the the high school girlfriend's name is Dina Parr, and I thought she played, she was good in, in in this documentary as well. I find it interesting. Tiger went to a public high school, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I never knew that about him that he went to a public high school. Credit to Earl and Coltita that they sent him to like he had a normal high school. You know, a lot of times these athletes in these uh, individual sports uh, don't have that normal sort of upbringing, at least from this perspective. And those home videos were great. I mean, they were, it looked like they were home videos yeah. taken by her family Yeah, during like, uh, you know, her, her family gatherings, gave a very good insight to what Tiger was like back then. I thought it was interesting when she would go into like how they would just do basic things that kids grow up doing and he had maybe never experienced before and how his eyes would light up like a little kid. You know, they'd go out for ice cream or something. Uh, right. They'd go to the movies and he'd be so excited in that moment. And you sort of get like a a sort of, not only peek under the hood, but sort of like a uh, sort of early stages of his like development, m- more way to put it. And I thought it was very interesting. And she kind of told her perspective. And look, I, you know, I, having a, most of his girlfriends in this documentary, you kind of know what perspective you're going to get on Tiger, right? I mean, yeah, I don't know. We have some people on Tiger's side, but for the most part, it's people that, you know, in retrospect might not have great things to say about Tiger. And I'm not saying that anything that she says or any of the other girlfriends say aren't completely accurate, but a couple of things like that she would say in this documentary kind of like annoyed me a little bit, like how she was trying to keep, you know, protect the sweetness of Tiger Woods. You know, she even said like, he didn't know what was coming with the fame and sure that's true. But like, she also said when he was on the golf course and, and she saw him signing autographs for the first time, she's like, why do people care about Tiger Woods? Like she, act, she, she sees now she, in retrospect, she yeah. oversold it. Right, she oversold right. the, I didn't know who Tiger Woods was. I agree with you on that. I don't even but, know that she oh, oversold oh. that, Mike. I just think like for her saying now that like, oh, she was looking out for Tiger and she knew what was coming with the fame and she was trying to help him with that. I don't know if that was true. I, that's true now that she looks back on it, but she didn't even, she had no idea about golf at the time. She didn't know anything about golf. So how would she know what fame was coming? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. She oversold that whole aspect. I, I couldn't agree with you right. more. And, but one thing with her is she still sounded to me like she's a little bit burned about how things ended with Tiger Woods. Dude, I mean, that might have been 25 years ago, but still very fresh for her. Did you get that? Well, well yeah, that and, and it's one of the the more remarkable stories you'll you'll kind of hear about Tiger. So and it and it kind of it speaks volumes to what Earl and that relationship was and, and and how much they were focused on getting him to be the best golfer he could be because and his relationship with just women in general, you kind of get all that in this this first relationship because you know, he, he was he was hanging out with her and we're kind of jumping all over all over the place in terms of time. We're kind of just talking about some big big picture stuff in this documentary. But yeah, you know, it's about the time where he was in what early in college, right? And it's Stanford and and he goes home and this is the one story that really kind of set her off. I don't think I've heard this one until this documentary, but he went home for the for a break, right, from school. And he said, I'll be home, you know, tomorrow. Well instead he came back a day early and just spent time at her house. And his parents, Tiger's parents, did not know about that. And when they find out about it, they're just furious because from Earl's perspective, he's thinking, you're going to let somebody, a a girl, you know, a girlfriend be a distraction from where you need to go. There's going to be plenty of women. And we know Earl's background. There's going to be plenty of women along the way. You don't need to get hung up on one now. You don't need to get a girl pregnant and have a kid and it just it, it, it kill your entire career. This is where their focus is. This is what they're worried about specifically. And it's not just his dad. Like his dad's pretty strict, but his mom's also very strict as well. They're both just furious to the point where they get on Tiger so bad that he just writes a letter. Okay. They've been together, I think, for at least a year. I don't remember exactly how three, long. Three years, she said. Okay. They had been together for a few years. All he does is write her a note. And leave her a note. Doesn't meet with her face to face. 
doesn't give her a phone call, just writes a note about, hey, we, I need to cut you out of my life. Sincerely, Tiger. Very professional written letter. Sounded like if it wasn't written by his parents, it was heavily edited by his parents. This girlfriend is shocked because it comes out of absolutely nowhere. And that's it. That's the end of their relationship after three years. Crazy. A, a three years that was, you know, from what you can tell, a happy time for her and a happy time for Tiger Woods. And we're getting this story from Joe Groman, who's that the club pro. Tiger was so scared to confront his parents about this that he basically asked Joe to come over and sort of help him out to sort of cushion the blow, if you will. Right. And that like their reaction, quote, spooked Tiger Woods, right? That like he, they started going into how she, he's going to get um, distracted by her, how, you know, he's going to get her pregnant and ruin everything, like kind of took things to another level. And to be, and to be fair, this is much Tita as Earl in this situation. Oh yeah. They, they made that perfectly clear. So both of these, both his parents played a very, Earl gets most of the headlines, but both of his parents played, played a very big role in every aspect of his life. And remember, he's in college at this point. Yeah. It's not like he's 13 years old. Right. And yeah, this was, a, this story was one of the, one of the more, I'm sure we're going to get a lot of eye opening stories in the next episode, but this one was pretty telling. Yeah. I, I'd known about the letter from the book, but I didn't realize she still had it too. Like she pulls it out. During this oh, documentary, yeah. what, 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 dude, what, what do you think about the fact that yeah. she still has it? Well, yeah, I mean, I, that it's obviously stuck with her, and she's. I mean, look, I think they legitimately had a, a true relationship. Now, I don't know, you know, it's Tiger's really first relationship, so you know, he was still kind of figuring himself out. Who knows how it would develop? But they, I think, it seemed like they had a really good thing going, and I can see where she's really burned about it because it just ended so abruptly, and she has still has no reason to figure out why that is. But how much do you think that letter could sell for right now? Um, it could sell for a lot of money. <laughs> and one thing is I I think that she still – it sounded like in that documentary, she still doesn't really know why. No, no idea. And she doesn't sound like she's even talked to him since. I could be wrong, but I got that feeling. No, I don't think they've ever spoken since then. Like literally Unreal. like it ended with a letter and like a written letter and that was it. I mean, how many times do you – how many times do you break up with someone – who you've been with, even if you haven't been with them for three years, and you break up with them and never speak to them again. That's pretty strange. Yeah. Look, all the, like, this is a big thing about Tiger. A lot of the relationships he has are, are very strenuous and very odd. And a lot of it plays in part because his parents' influence on him. And you, well, I think we're going to hear about a lot of that. But it, again, that book will tell you a lot about those too if you really want to get into this stuff. But on the course, let's shift back on the course. So, Tiger. A couple of big things here. Tiger's rise to fame, right? That's what this episode's about. So you know, we see Tiger you know, early on, the Bob Hope show. We've, we've seen that clip many, many times. We see his development into becoming the, the really good golfer he is to the U.S. Amateur where he wins three in a row, right? And I, was, I had no idea to this point that Brent Musburger was on the call for his first U.S. Amateur. That was amazing. And I caught that too. And you got to remember, this is, this is Brent Musburger at the height of his powers here. So this is still top of the line broadcaster Brent Musburger. So it shows you how, I mean, could you imagine, trying to think of an example, but could you imagine uh, Brad Nessler doing the uh, U.S. golf championship, amateur championship right now? Like it just wouldn't happen. So right. that's how big of a star Tiger Woods was that people knew. This is where this time period between 94 and 96 is when, I don't know about for you, but this is when he became known to me. Yeah, yeah. Because he because um, it went yeah. in the amateurs, and then he became on you know he got the cover I think of SI and like all the hype was there at that point, like like LeBron when he was in like early high school, like you'd heard about him, you don't know how much you actually seen him play, but you're aware of who this person is. Yeah, you know I thought that you bring up the SI uh, the SI writer Gary Smith, I thought had some very interesting perspective on this period of his life, and that Tiger was very reserved at this point. You couldn't get him to say much. But he made a point at saying, you know, if you wanted to know something about Tiger, just go buy Earl a couple of drinks and he'll let you know whatever you want to know. Yeah. And I think Earl was, yeah, he was very open about things. He, he spoke because he, 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 I think he fully believed everything he said, but he would, you know, he would speak very broadly about what Tiger Woods could become. And, and, and we know that. So I'm sure he gave a lot of good quotes. But I always think it's interesting the balance that, that a writer has to find between, you know, he, the SI writer says, hey, and they told me, go out and, and find out what this Tiger Woods guy is all about. Like, it's that balance between trying to tell the story, but also looking for things to point out that maybe aren't necessary, like trying to find those maybe the darker elements to a person. You know, that's that's it, it kind of bothers people a lot when they kind of see that or hear that. Like, hey, go, go, go search and find something from Tiger. 
Yeah. And remember, we're back to the point where this is right around the time period where he gave that speech at the banquet that we talked about right at the top of this. So we're right during that period. So what Earl's been believing for the last, you know, 15, 20 years, he's now letting the world know. And he's doing it, you know, by all accounts, any chance he gets. Yep. And, you know, he gets off. Obviously, after he finishes amateur, he gets out on the PGA Tour, wins the Masters almost right away. And and here we are watching this guy that's uh, everything he's worked up towards is is coming to fruition this quickly. I mean, that was what was so amazing. Not only is this guy great, but he's he's delivering out of the gates and everything that that Earl had worked for and and worked with Tiger on it. The fruits of the labor is, is now coming through and we see the embrace, the emotion, like all this is happening right now. But I think the other big part about this right now is is the race side of this, right? And it's been this way for his whole career. I mean, we knew Earl's been talking about it. You know, he's going to change golf, right? This black man is going to change the way we look at golf in a white sport, right, essentially. And once Tyra gets to that point, there's a lot of criticism because he doesn't fully embrace the maybe the black side of his heritage, right? And and whether or not that's right, I think that's up to Tiger to, to determine. But he he talks about how he's got so many different ancestors, right? Black, you know, uh, his, his mom's side, the Asian side, um, some white in his family, like all this stuff. So he, he cur- coins a new term that, that he wants to call himself rather than being black. And this offends a lot of people. You know, the first time I could remember him saying that, that term that you're describing was on the Oprah show, um, in right. an interview with Oprah Winfrey. You could even see her face during the interview. Like, like, what are you talking about? She sort of looked confused when he said it. And to be honest, I think it's something that's stuck with Tiger Woods since that moment. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it's something that when, when certain people think of his story, it's a big part of it. Cablin Asian is what he said. Cablin Asian with black and Asian, white, Native, uh, Native American, like a lot of different stuff in there. And he's kind of coined his own term. But now everybody, everybody's just saying it. it would, and and I, I thought it was the Wanda Sykes special was funny. Um, that was funny. He sort of said it in an awkward way, too, right. which didn't help. And it just, again, I think it kind of speaks to him like, still at a young age, like not really being too great at reading a room and not knowing how to term things a certain way. And when he's left to not like be a robot, these are the kind of things that may come out of his mouth. And I also too, I don't like, I don't know if he's fully ready to be that person, right. To be like the black savior, essentially. Like maybe he's kind of pushing off a little bit of that responsibility early on, because that's a lot, man. That's pretty powerful stuff when you're 21, 22 years old and everyone's looking to you to kind of be that that racially now it's different when you're on the golf course like you have control of that stuff right like that's who you are but like this is a bigger much bigger issue and that's got to be pretty tough for anybody so i think probably you know i assume that's got to play a little bit into this decision not to fully embrace it i think he's done it more over time but also it's not like he's not doing anything for the sport right in, in terms of, of black people getting access because that that Nike ad that first ran when they came on the scene and credit Nike, they always come up with these very incredible concepts where he's talking about there's a lot of places that don't let me play golf. A lot of places that don't uh, you know allow me in because of the color of my skin. So it's not like he completely just abandoned his race uh, for the betterment of, of himself and money. Yeah, and I think that's what made uh, his his statements on Oprah even more puzzling to people because he had this these Hello World Nike ads which you'll remember in two seconds if you were around back then watching TV once you watch them. That put him on the radar, I think, for even non-golf fans, those ads. And I think that's what made his statements on Oprah even more confusing because he has these ads. Now he's saying this on Oprah. You know, at this point, does Tiger Woods even know who he is or what he wants to be? I think that was the thought of a lot of people who thought a little more in depth to things, like maybe who didn't just appreciate him for the golfer he was, or you know, people who want to kind of make a story about his life and his impact off the course. Right. Yeah. I think that's true. And you know, we also see a second girlfriend gets on camera, Amber Laria. And again, I think this perspective from the, the, the women in this is tiger, the person, you know, we see the golfer, but the person tiger, you know, is trying to deal with the, the fame and the, and the pressures of reality. And she even kind of points that out. She's on here a little bit, but she's basically talking about how he's looking for ways to escape all these pressures many, many times. That's what kind of what she notices the most. Yeah, and she goes into a story about how he gets into scuba diving, like really, really into scuba diving. Yeah. And that she asks him, like, hey, what's with the scuba diving, you know? Because this is at the point where he's he's very famous at this point. And he just told her, hey, look, when I go down there, the fishies don't know me. Yeah, pretty crazy. And hey, look, uh, that, that's 
we saw in the Jordan documentary how he had different ways to escape. This was that example for Tiger Woods. Yeah, we don't we don't understand these things um, as being average people, Mike, in terms of like celebrity and stuff, right? Like we don't you don't know that true pressure of, of literally everyone knowing who you are everywhere you go. And that was a very interesting and powerful statement about just being under there and nobody knows who you are. You can kind of escape everything. So we kind of we're, we're getting we're getting to see like behind who, you know, the, the inside internal struggles of Tiger plus the outward like fame and, and celebrities got. And this is right around to around around 2000. So this is like peak tiger. We're getting to the getting to peak tiger right around this time, because this is when he wins the tiger slam, right? He wins all four majors in a row, not in the same calendar year starts with that U S open in 2000, which was one of the most dominant performances of all time, British PGA. And then comes back around to what Hootie Johnson, the, the uh, head of the masters, Augusta said at the time, if he wins this, it's, it's the, the biggest you know, golf achievement ever. And he does. He goes in and wins that 2001 Masters, and now he's got the Tiger Slam. He is at the top of the world. This is peak Tiger at this point. Everything that 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 he he's, he's worked for is there, right? But now, while this is happening, this is kind of the splintering of his relationship with Earl too, because he sees Tiger sees the business side of this. He's really focused on the money, the endorsements. Like he's getting so much money from these these major major companies that there's this this faction that he doesn't know that Earl can really be that business person and manage that business part side of things. And he kind of moves away from Earl at this time. He does. Yep. He, he moves away from Earl. Um, you know, this is peak tiger. I think this is his 500, the, the, the years of his $500 million Nike deal, which is only one of, you know, many endorsements he had. Again, uh, I think this is some of the, where the pent up issues with his father sort of begin to really, really surface and he begins begins to come bitter about them and couple that with the fact that he's just busy from running an empire. And like you said, their relationship starts to splinter a little bit. I thought from a golf perspective, Ben, that when I think of this period, like you have, again, I'm very surface level golf, but his fitness becomes a big deal at this time that he's just in better shape than all the other golfers. And he's like truly ahead of the curve on his competition. And I think that being ahead of the curve on his competition, he was ahead of the curve on his competition for almost maybe a decade, it seemed like. Yeah. From a, from an athlete standpoint, you have to remember, he may be the most popular athlete in the world at this point. Yep. Because this is when Jordan, you know, Jordan retires here in 98. So when you get to like at 2000, when he's completing this Tiger Slam, as you mentioned, that's the kind of level of athlete we're talking about with Tiger Woods, like most popular athlete on the planet and one of the most popular people on the planet. Yeah, he's he's at the top of the world at this point. And you know, I also think back to like they also it's kind of the time where they highlight the the womanizing of his father did. Like, you know, it wasn't done at the beginning when we talked about it. It was done kind of this point, but you know, I think it shows you a lot of the relationships that Tiger has and, and how he dealt with these relationships with women because this is the the guidance he had was seeing the like his dad and, and the and the pro chasing women and it would all happen in front of him. It put strain on him and his relationship with his mother too, because he had to hide it all, right? He kept it all secret. And these this is all something he's dealing with this, during this time too. And, and like there's a lot there's a lot more to people than we always know. And this is what Tiger was dealing with. And there's there's a ton on Tiger. And, and, and look, I'm not gonna justify anything that he would end up doing. But when you think about this relationship with his parents, dealing with all that and and try to keep his dad happy and his mom happy at the same time and being pulled both ways along with all the fame that came along with his career. I mean, there's so much, so much weight on him at this point. There is. And you got to remember at this point, how old is he? He's like not even 25 years old. No, right? he's like 21, 22. Yeah. Somebody like that 23. Yeah. He was, he was 21 and 97, right? When he won the yeah. masters. So yeah, he's about, yeah, he's not even 25 years old yet having to think with all this. And remember he might have a swing coach. He might have a caddy, right? But he doesn't have teammates. He doesn't have like the support of a whole organization like these other team sport athletes have. He has, you know, a small circle of people that he's around and he, it's primarily him going through all of this. I don't want to say alone, but when it comes down to it, you know, he can't go in his teammates, you know, hotel room and play some cards to unwind a little bit. Uh, right. these, these, these individual sport athletes, I think at the top levels deal with very unique issues. Yeah, that's a great point. And the last part of this documentary we, we, we get to, you know, post Tiger Slam, we've got the relationship with Elon starting, right? He meets her on uh, on the tour 
she was the nanny for Jesper Parnovic. If you follow golf, you'll know who he is, especially with yep. his unique fashion. But yep. that the relationship, pink hat, right? What's that? The pink hat. Oh yeah, he he, he a very yep. colorful guy, very colorful guy. This relationship starts, and it seems to be a really good thing for both Tiger and her. It seems to be a perfect fit. You know, it seems to be like he's he's ready to kind of settle in and, and start that family, and and her have some you know some balance for him, give that, provide that balance for him in his life around 2003. But then his dad dies in 06, you know, again, this last few years of his dad's life, there's, there's not, the, the relationship is kind of, it's, it's faded a little bit. It's, you know, they're obviously still there, but you know, when you, they, they reflect back on the fact that these guys were best friends and, and both of them talk like that, how they'd always be in each other's life. And at this point in, in Earl's struggle with uh, all the health issues he's dealing with, you know, Tiger's not always there, and I think it, it weighed on both of them. Obviously, Earl, towards the end, we see him getting very emotional, but then Tiger's left to kind of deal with that afterwards. He is, and look, they they got driven apart from each other. I think Tiger was very impacted by the womanizing as he got older. They get driven apart. Not that there's ever good timing for this, but the timing of them, sort of their relationship going sideways, almost coincided, it sounded like, with Earl's health deteriorating. Which I think was unfortunate. I think all of his, all of his emotions bubbled over in that 2005 master speech after he wins, in his acceptance speech of the uh, of the green jacket. He gets very emotional about his dad. I think those were some of those emotions you just described, sort of flooding in for him and realizing that you know uh, maybe as his dad's health has been deteriorating, you know he hasn't been as present as he would like and wanted to make sure that he you know he really thanked his father for everything. And I think this is a, a very pivotal moment in Tiger's career, which we're going about, about to learn about, I think, in the upcoming episodes. But if, if you know about Tiger, this is kind of a, a point where, you know, he's trying to figure himself out now. And, and, and there's a lot on him at this point. And, and, and we get a little preview, Mike, as we move into our, our next episode. And, um, well, I guess just quickly mention, like, you know, him dealing with this as part of this. Like, he, he finds a little bit of peace at the 2006 British Open. He let a lot of that emotion out finally uh, after his tiger, his dad's death and, and you know, hugging his caddy Steve for a while and, and just crying on his shoulder. Like you kind of see that entire release, but kind of after that's gone and, and, and he buries his dad, like this is kind of when life changes and we see your girl sit down on camera as a tease for the next episode. Yep. So this episode ends with Rachel Yucatel. You know that name if you know Tiger Woods sitting down in a seat and basically asking the person in front of her, what do you want me to talk about? And just based on her attitude, saying those couple words, I think next week's episode is going to be very interesting. Yeah. And we're going to see the the fall. I think the fall of Tiger's next. So this is the part of the episode everybody's going to be looking forward to. But I think going back and understanding who Tiger is, this first episode kind of helps you understand that to an extent, at least gives you kind of the, the, the core of what's most important there and his rise to fame. So overall, a, a pretty good first episode. I didn't learn a ton new, but I think a lot of just kind of general sports fans, not huge, huge golf fans, Tiger fans, will probably get a lot out of this episode. I think they definitely will also. And one thing to go check out about this episode that I thought was a very unique perspective was Nick Faldo, who played with Tiger Woods his first round at the 97 Masters when Tiger struggled on the front nine and right. then – basically the rest is history in 97 and then also played with him the first two rounds after his dad's death in the British Open yeah and the perspective he had I thought was great and a couple other quick notes before we close out if you have any other thoughts Mike uh, you know obviously there's a lot of these documentaries we can't cover everything but um, a couple interesting nuggets golf nuggets that I, I enjoyed from this first off you kind of see you get to see Tiger's competitive spirit a little bit. And this isn't really about Tiger's golf. I mean, you, we, we kind of get the the high level. Tiger's really good. He's winning all these majors, but we don't get a lot of the details of how he, how he acts on the course, his competitive spirit on the course, that kind of stuff. We do get a little bit of it, though. We talk about the Masters and his, uh, his kind of rivalry with Phil Mickelson, which has developed differently over time. It started off... It was there a little bit, but but Phil could never win the big ones, and he was always a little bit older than Tiger. So you know, Tiger was was the guy, and you know, a couple other guys came in. David Duvall, uh, VJ Singh were there, top of the game for a while. But you know, Phil's come back around towards the end of his careers. He's won a bunch of majors, and 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 you know, become a very big personality in the sport. But I thought it was pretty funny. Cause I don't think I'd heard this before. I'm sure other people have, but that you know, when they were playing, Tiger was obviously a big competitor of 
of or Phil is obviously a big competitor of Tiger's because he had a lot of the records in California, Southern California, in junior golf that Tiger was chasing, and and they were very aware of who of who Phil was. But his mom, dude, his mom has that competitive energy too. I, I love the story about how you know Phil's called Lefty, right? That's his nickname, but she would call him Hefty out on the course. That's that was like that was like a Tita moment where I was like, wow. You know, and that made me chuckle when I heard that. And and if you and that was the one thing that went through with Tiger Woods, why Phil Mickelson frustrated him so much. Tiger looked at Phil Mickelson as one of the like the most natural golfer he's ever seen, but that he couldn't control like maybe the physical aspects of being a golfer and being in shape, and that that sort of maybe kept Phil back from achieving his true potential. When you compare it with Tiger Woods, who is golf, 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 fitness, 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 Tiger could never identify with that. And he probably got a lot of that, as it turns out, from his mother. And Hefty is an all-timer. As a lefty, <laughs> myself, who is not on the skinny side, you know, hey, look, even I can chuckle at that nickname. And and you kind of get a sense, too, if you want to know how it was in golf when Tiger was at the top of his game and, and really out hitting everyone distance-wise. Because golf's different now. Everybody's hitting it a mile. And, you know, you don't have any you – know, besides Bryson, you don't have a huge advantage in, in distance. Because everybody's hitting it th- between 300 and 340. But in this one, we see uh, when he's going head to head against Phil to win this this Masters, and on the thirteenth, you know, dog leg left par five, Phil hits a nice drive out there, beautiful drive, puts himself in perfect shape. Tiger gets a three wood out, three wood to Phil's driver and hits it behind by about forty yards, and even to the point where Phil said, "Is that do you always hit your three wood that far?" And he said, and Tiger says, "Usually further," and you could just tell like that's. That's how dominant he was over the sport and how much his presence kind of hovered over everyone and why he was so good. Because anybody that tried to compete with him late in a round, in a tournament struggled because of just how much he would just mentally beat you down and make you try. You're playing him along with the course. It was why it was so difficult to beat him. Yeah, and you know, I was waiting for that, hey, Tiger's interaction with other players. We didn't get that much in this yeah, episode. I don't think we will get much of that, though. Yeah, but that story was great. I exactly. mean, you're looking for that, like, that Jordan edge, if you if you will, right, right, and just in golf, if you have to do it in little subtle ways as opposed to on like a basketball court. Yeah. So I thought that that was very interesting and how how real the mental game is in golf, which I think we're all aware of. Yeah, and because we don't you know, in basketball, we're watching these guys up and down the court. Like in golf, you see them when they're hitting their shots. So you don't get to see a lot of that interaction walking, but from tee from the tee to your shot or from your shot in the fairway to the green, like. We don't get to see a lot of interaction typically in t- on on a broadcast. So, you know, it, getting to any kind of uh, look inside of the ropes is, uh, is is special and something you don't get access to very often. So that was good to see. Is there anything, uh, any other nuggets from this episode you want to get on before we close it out? Uh, ben, honestly, I think we did it. We did a pretty good job overall covering everything I wanted to get to. Did you have anything else? That's it for me. Uh, I thought overall good episode as I, as I mentioned. Um, good start. I'm curious to see where this goes because a lot of the a lot of stuff I read so far, like reaction and reviews to the documentary, are too favorable of, of of Tiger in terms of not even like okay, we hate Tiger now. More or less like this documentary doesn't shine a great light on Tiger, and it looks like it goes out of its way to kind of do that. So I'm curious to see how this thing unfolds. Golf people overall very protective of Tiger Woods. You have to remember that, Ben. I know you know that. It's very polarizing, man. There's a lot of people that just hate him for for what he's done, but other people that know like everything he's kind of been through and, and just appreciates who he is as a golfer and the greatness of him. That look, nobody's gonna be perfect, Mike. We forget this this these days. I, understood. You know I, mean? I agree. So looking forward to it. we'll we'll recap that episode next week as well. We got another true crime mini sode coming out, so make sure you hit subscribe on the podcast rate and review. If you're on YouTube, hit subscribe as well. Almost over 700 subscribers. Maybe you are by the time uh, you hear this episode. But we appreciate everybody that's checked us out on YouTube as well. You can find us online, just at replaypodcast.com, Twitter, and Instagram as well. Mike, enjoyed this one. Looking forward to the next uh, part. Same here. Until next time.